Dr. Peter Glidden, your steadfast advocate for health. I'm a licensed naturopathic doctor, and this is a worldwide free webinar where I hope to educate you to the best of my ability about the medical effectiveness of marijuana. And again, the perspective that I bring to bear is as a licensed naturopathic doctor. And for those of you who are not aware of that medical distinction, that's a very good place to start. So the initials after my name are ND. In order to become a licensed naturopathic doctor in the U.S., you have to do four years of pre-med, four years of naturopathic medical school, fully accredited naturopathic medical schools, by the way. I did my pre-med at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and graduated from Bastyr University of Naturopathic Medicine in Seattle. Part of the education is a thousand hours of clinical supervision. Then you have to graduate. Then you have to pass national boards, state boards, get a license, and pursue continuing education credit. I have to secure 25 hours of continuing education credit every year to continue to practice naturopathic medicine. I'm currently licensed in the great state of Minnesota, and I've been doing this for 29 years. I have 29 years of clinical experience in the treatment of patients with primary care naturopathic medical therapeutics. So I have a very good perspective here to help you understand different medical topics. Tonight we're going to jump into the medical marijuana pool and see if we can't figure it out. Now, naturopathic medicine prides itself on marrying the scientific technique with holistic medical philosophy, right? So we attempt to prove that our points of view and our therapeutics are effective. And it's interesting, you probably didn't know this, but did you know that naturopathic doctors can prescribe drugs? Well, we can. I haven't need I've I've prescribed one drug to one patient in 29 years of clinical work. And in retrospect, I didn't really need to do that, but I was fresh out of naturopathic medical school and I was a little nervous. It's not the drug, it's how it's used. Thank God for Novocaine. Thank God for the sterile technique. Thank God for a handful of antibiotics, right? Pain medication, a, a few. But there's a problem in the delivery of modern American medicine because it's not a free medical market. And I don't mean free that you don't have to pay for it. I mean it's a monopolization, it's a monopolized medical marketplace. The American Medical Association was given exclusive control in 1912 by Congress to determine who could and who could not call themselves a doctor and to determine medical education. They monopolized the medical marketplace. The MDs and the American Medical Association monopolized the medical marketplace in 1912. That's why MD-directed medicine is everywhere all the time. It's not because they're better at what they do than the chiropractors or the naturopaths or the homeopaths or the herbalists or the acupuncturists or the Ayurvedic practitioners or anybody else. It's because they legislated themselves into first place and they aggressively threw everybody else off of the train of medicine. <laughs> you know, and that's not good. I, as a licensed naturopathic doctor, it's tragic. I'm only allowed to practice medicine in 24 states. Oh, plus the Virgin Islands, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. So does that mean that the laws of medicine change when you cross the state line? No, it's not a scientific or humanitarian reason. It's political. Because by and large, naturopathic doctors are taught therapeutics other than drugs and surgery. And so do you think the pharmaceutical industry is in favor of my profession or not? It's a tragedy of biblical proportions, but it is what it is. So, a good place to start to understand any medical concept is through research. And the National Institutes of Health have a wonderful website. It's called PubMed.com, where they keep an archive of millions, literally millions, of published research papers. You can go to PubMed.com and type in any search criteria that you want, and you'll see tons of research pop up. So that's what I did. I went there and I typed in cannabis, and I got 17,605 results. Now, not all of these results were about the medical use of cannabis, but nonetheless, 
it is a very well-researched topic. Publish, which begs the question, why is your medical doctor not using it more? Well, because it's not promoted by Big Pharma. And there's an intimate relationship between what your medical doctor knows and does and pharmaceutical propaganda, for lack of a better word. Here was a very interesting study that I pulled up. This was a retrospective analysis of lots of different research done um, about the benefits and or harms of medical marijuana in chronic pain or post-traumatic stress disorder. Here's what they concluded. Um, overall, we found limited evidence on the potential benefits and harms of cannabis in chronic pain populations. We found low-strength evidence that cannabis preparations with precisely defined THC cannabinoid content, and I'm going to tell you what that means in a minute, may alleviate nerve pain, but insufficient evidence in populations with other types of pain. All right? So, nerve pain, marijuana, medical marijuana was effective at helping. This study recently published medical marijuana extremely effective in the management of fibromyalgia pain. That was just published on February 14th, 2018, a couple days ago. This was my favorite one, though. Uh, can you see it here? The Therapeutic Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids, an update from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. This was a really interesting thing. You know what they did? They looked at 10,000 10, published studies. 10,000 published studies on the use of medical marijuana. That's a lot. And they drew conclusions. Here's what they said after they reviewed the literature 10,000 times. The report concluded that there was conclusive evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for the treatment of pain in adults, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and the spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis. Moderate evidence was found that cannabis was good at sleep disorders, helping to mitigate sleep trouble. However, the evidence supporting um, improvement in appetite, Tourette syndrome, anxiety, PTSD, cancer, irritable bowel syndrome, epilepsy, and multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's was not very good. So, cannabis has been proven to be effective for nerve pain, adult onset pain, uh, fibromyalgia pain, the nausea and vomiting induced by chemotherapy, certain sleep disorders, and muscle spasticity of multiple sclerosis, but not so much for anything else. However, here's something else that they said. A chapter in this report enumerated multiple barriers to conducting research on cannabis, medical marijuana, in the U.S., which may explain the paucity of positive therapeutic benefits in the published literature to date, which means that the laws in place which regulate the use of marijuana are so restrictive that it's very difficult for legitimate research organizations to secure marijuana and to get an okay to do the research. Now, why do you think it's like that? Well, because marijuana is a naturally occurring substance, and you cannot patent a naturally occurring substance. You can't go to Washington, D.C. and patent orange juice or oxygen. And if you can't patent it, then anybody can make it. This is how drug companies make massive profits, because... They patent their medicines, right? Um, Premarin was a, a perfect example. Premarin was a one-part horse hormone. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, two parts horse hormone and one part human hormone. Horse hormone. That's why it was called Premarin, because it was made, the, the horse hormones were extracted from the urine of pregnant mares. Premarin, pregnant mares, right? Crazy. But that's a molecule that's not naturally occurring in nature, right? 
so they can patent it. And when they can patent it, they're the only ones that can sell it. So marijuana being a naturally occurring substance, nobody can patent it. So the pharmaceutical industry is not interested in researching it. And because of the intimate relationship between big pharma and governments, they're going to put roadblocks to researching it. And that's a problem. As it turns out we don't have a free medical market, right? Now, this is a really good website to go to. I'm going to pull this up here if I can in just a second. It's a very good website. It's called sclabs.com. Now, in full disclosure here, I, I am in no way, shape, or form affiliated with SC Labs. I have, I have nothing to do with them whatsoever, but it's a really good place to go to educate yourself about uh, medical marijuana. So let me see if I can't make this happen. Okay, so sclabs.com, like Southern California Labs.com. This is their website. Pretty good looking website. Lots of information here that you can browse at your leisure. But there's one thing that I want to um, talk about right now the cannabinoid content of marijuana. Now, Marijuana is a botanical medicine. It's an herb, right? It's an herbal medicine. And naturopathic doctors use herbal medicines extensively. Cannabis is no exception to the rule, although, right, the legalities regarding the therapeutic use of cannabis are extreme. But marijuana is a plant. It's an herb, just like echinacea or golden seal or uh, the common daisy. And because it's a plant, it contains many different phytochemical components, right? Many different phytochemical components. And the ones that seem to be effective medically are called cannabinoids. They're called cannabinoids. These are biochemical, phytochemical. A biochemical occurring in a plant is called a phytochemical. These are phytochemicals in the marijuana plant and there are a lot of different ones, right? And they all have acronyms. THCA, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid. Yeah, say that 10 times fast. THC, tetra, tetrahydrocannabinol, right? And, you know, all these other ones, right? CBD and CBG and TC, THCV and CBDV and CBGB, <laughs> right? These are all different phytochemical components of the marijuana plant. And the one that everybody focuses on is this one here, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, because this is the chemical component, the phytochemical component in marijuana that makes people stoned, right? It is a um, psychoactive drug, it gives you auditory and visual hallucinations. It tunes your central nervous system into different uh, frequencies of reality in the same way that uh, most psychoactive drugs do. Uh, and, you know, this is why everybody and their brother smokes marijuana. It's to get to experience that otherworldly experience, right? Delivered by the cannabinoid called THC, which is an acronym for tetrahydrocannabinol. Now, interestingly enough, the THC component that makes people stoned is has very little, to, if anything, to do with positive medicinal effects of the plant. The positive medicinal effects of the plant come from other cannabinoids, especially CBD, this one right here. Cannabidiol, cannabidiol, say that 10 times fast. Cannabidiol has tremendous medical potential. This is particularly true in the collect ratio of cannabidiol and THC is applied to treat a particular condition, right? So it's not the stuff that makes people stoned, the tetrahydrocannabinol, the THC, that delivers the therapeutic effects of medical marijuana to people in trouble. And the companies that are facilitating the research here and bringing this stuff to the marketplace 
are extracting the cannabinoids like CBD out of the marijuana plant. So the medicine that you are actually delivered has very little, if any, THC in it. And this is a very interesting point to ponder. This is a very important point to understand here, that there's a great deal of difference biochemically between uh, marijuana in its you know, natural state, which you dry and then powder and pulverize and smoke, and medical marijuana, because the medical marijuana has had the, the it, it, it extracts certain cannabinoids from the plant and excludes others. That's a very important